G'day, g'day. Welcome to a, another episode of Bitopia's weekly discussions. Bitopia University is the world's first decentralized autonomous university. Uh, this is our fourth episode. You can check out the other ones that are placed on YouTube and soon they will be placed on other platforms as well. On uh, today's episode, I'm going to cover some uh, interesting topics. Um, I have some very interesting things lined up. Uh, I will begin though with the usual. Uh, if you want to learn more about Bitopia, Bitopia University, if you want to get involved, collaborate, contribute, uh, whether you're a student or whether you have a course to offer, uh, please reach out. You can find our details via our website which is bitopia.org. There you can subscribe to our newsletter uh, to keep in uh, touch or keep updated with our progress. And at the bottom, you will see our other platforms where you can connect with us, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or Telegram. Our Telegram chat and uh, our campus platform, campus.bitopia.org is where the conversations take place. So if you want to be a part of that, either go to campus.bitopia.org or go on Telegram and join our Telegram group, uh, which is bitopia underscore you, uh, or simply click on the link, which will bring you there. You can follow the other episodes to learn a bit, about, a bit more about what had been discussed in previous episodes. So every week uh, we cover a different topic to just give people a way of understanding what it is that Bitopia is doing as well as give you some insight on recent news or conversations that are taking place. If there's something that you're interested in and you want it to be a part of the discussion, please reach out and let me know uh, via the channels that I just went over. So without further ado, let's begin. So I've kept today's uh, topic a bit cheeky, uh, which is a topic that I have personally been involved with for a very long time. So what does that mean? It means that over the years, uh, and this would make it the eighth year, if I had a dollar for every time a person came up to me and said, oh, Bitcoin, isn't that thing that criminals use? Isn't that thing that it's just for the dark net? Um, it's for avoiding uh, having to pay tax. So all these topics come up as the first concept when people want to discuss Bitcoin. And uh, this has some impact on the conversation, obviously, because that is where people's mind has been placed when they refer to Bitcoin. And uh, interestingly enough, I even went on to Google and I just typed Bitcoin is for, and these are the things that came up. I wouldn't consider majority of them of, you know, being very positive, though that is the reality of the situation. And uh, this can be applied to Bitcoin, this can be applied to many different things in life uh, that are not mainstream, that have a negative image for some reason, and that is what I am trying to change through Bitopia and other courses that will soon be offered. So just keep in mind Bitopia University, while uh, it is the first decentralized autonomous university. It will be offering courses on a variety of topics. And uh, I'm very excited to see what kind of topics or courses people have to offer. And uh, the entire dynamic between teachers and students and people being able to contribute to the curriculum of the courses itself uh, is what makes Bitopia very unique in itself. So as you see, the second one there is Bitcoin is for criminals. And uh, this is something that I've had to face over the years of meeting people uh, 
who don't have the basic understanding of Bitcoin is. And these are the sort of subjects that come up rather than I heard Bitcoin is the first decentralized currency in the world. Uh, I heard it's the first uh, currency not controlled by the state. You know, it's, it's much more common to go down uh, the subject of it being for criminal use or something negative uh, when you meet a stranger than something a bit more inspiring and uh, acceptable in accordance to what it really is. And uh, depending on who you ask, you will get different answers. So if you ask a anarchist what, a Bitcoin, what is Bitcoin, you will get a very different answer than if you ask a libertarian, if you ask a statist who might say it's illegal money, it should be banned and uh, so on. And such is the case with most things in life. Uh, it depends who you ask, right? Though, if we remove ideology, uh, which is very healthy to do, and uh, we look at it from an engineering perspective, simply engineering perspective, as a design perspective, the current systems in place, uh, very much depicted by this poster from 1911, uh, you can see that, you know, you can read into this however you like, though we can all agree that systematic risk is placed on the average citizen. So while we have the Federal Reserve, we have the central banks and the IMF, European Central Bank, and uh, all these other organizations, uh, most of the risk is passed on to the people. So an example of this would be 2008. And even now, uh, the stimulus packages that are coming out, uh, you can imagine that, for example, if you're aware of the fractional reserve system, it's a system which allows banks to loan out, uh, for example, if $1,200 is deposited into a bank, uh, they are allowed to lend out $12,000. So while the stimulus packages does help the citizen, it also allows the bank uh, to lend out 10 times the amount for every $1,200, let's say, that goes into a person's bank account. Uh, so you have to look at it from both perspectives. And systematic risk is passed on to the, per to the people, the citizens of the country, because after 2008, uh, you know, all the bailouts that took place it is the taxpayers' money that is used for that. Uh, and there lies the problem. So systematic risk from an engineering perspective, we're removing ideology. You know, whether how you feel about capitalism and all of that, we can put it to the side. From an engineering perspective, we can perhaps design a system that's better. We can perhaps design a system uh, or framework that shares that systematic risk with the people that are placing the risk within the system. So the average citizen did not partake in uh, increasing the supply of money, though they have to uh, share the burden of the debt that is added to the country's uh, growing num number when we're considering debt. So how do we design it differently? How do we make it so the average person is not placed at the bottom? How do we make it flat? How do we make it that individuals at least have some sort of a say in uh, the increase in supply of money and the security of knowing that the money they hold uh, will not be devalued? So these are the topics that we can explore. So from an engineering perspective, we can see that such a system that places people at the bottom um, is not very well designed, to say the least. And we can for sure make improvements. And what is Bitcoin? What Bitcoin is, we can simply refer to the maker of Bitcoin and what was said about it. You know, we, you know, as I said, it depends on who you ask, though it's much better if we just look at the original statement. Now, this statement was made on February 11th, 2009 by a user with the username Satoshi Nakamoto. 
In it, it describes that the person has developed an open source peer-to-peer eCash system called Bitcoin. It's completely decentralized with no central server or trust trusted parties. So that's been mentioned there. The root problem with conventional currency is all the trust that's required to make it work. The central bank must be trusted not to debase the currency. But the history of fiat currencies is full of breaches of that trust. Banks must be trusted to hold our money and transfer it electronically. But they lend it out in waves of credit bubbles with barely a fraction in reserve. As I mentioned, banks legally have the right to lend out 10 times the amount. So if you deposit your salary into your bank account, let's say $3,000, the bank can now loan out $30,000. We've had to trust them with our privacy, trust them not to let identity thieves drain our accounts. Their massive overhead costs make micropayments impossible. What are micropayments? Micropayments, let's say that you have a service such as Facebook. Imagine for every post you make, you were given a small amount of money. Now, the traditional systems in place, it would be very, very expensive uh, to continuously on a daily basis, let's say every three hours, send you uh, a payment. You know, the, the administrational cost for such a thing uh, would be huge. And that is because the current monetary system, financial systems, were never designed uh, to work on the internet on such a large scale. That is why we have so many problems with fraud and uh, scams and uh, corruption, etc., etc., and lack of transparency. So back in the days, that was great. You know, that worked good for people. Uh, they didn't have to keep money at home. They could put it in a bank. Um, and that had its own consequences. Though the moment we left the currency which was backed by gold, and then we moved on to a currency based on debt, uh, things got a bit out of control because debt could be unlimited, right? So there's no limit. Gold is a limited supply. So you can't just print money unless you have the gold in hand. Though the moment we shifted over to a system backed by debt, um, you can imagine the roof uh, for the country's uh, debt increased dramatically. And there's a lot of videos out there. You can look into these things. Uh, this isn't so much about the financial system, more about what Bitcoin came to fix. So Bitcoin took that uh, control from the state and distributed it on a decentralized network. It meant that anyone in the world now had access to currency, regardless of their geographical location, regardless of uh, the political views, regardless of their gender, regardless of anything else. Even a dog can have a QR code on their collar with a Bitcoin wallet address, uh, which they can go to a vet and, uh, or someone can donate money to the dog and then they can go to a vet and uh, you know, do whatever they need to do. This is just in theory, obviously. Um, and you can have self-driving cars that function purely in an automated way by receiving that income and uh, taking themselves to the garage or wherever else and paying for their fees. So you can't do this very easily with the traditional financial systems in place. So Bitcoin was created for the internet. And uh, because of that, it has a huge advantage over existing financial systems uh, that lack transparency, inclusivity, uh, accountability, and uh, where you don't really have a say on uh, how money is produced and the increase in its supply, which you, at the end of the day, have to carry the burden for. Moving on from there, so is Bitcoin really for criminals? I mean, sure, knives could be used for, by a criminal, uh, many things in life, like, you know, a table could be dismantled and turned into a weapon. Uh, video cameras could be used to capture beautiful, you know, a beautiful sunset 
or it could be used to capture something gruesome or uh, less desirable. Though we don't place that restriction on the video cameras themselves because some people use it for the wrong thing. And uh, to say that Bitcoin is used by criminals uh, would be missing this huge part of what Bitcoin is and uh, focusing on a grain of sand uh, on a beach uh, filled with opportunities and uh, uh, applications that Bitcoin could be used for. And it's not just Bitcoin, it's the decentralized system behind it referred to as a blockchain uh, that has many applications as well. So you gather some thoughts from there and uh, I hope it can lead you to searching it in a different direction. And this is a part of our course. Uh, if you want to learn, reach out and we will go over these things and you will learn how to use it yourself. Uh, we will go over the various wallets, security parameters, privacy parameters, uh, how to buy it, how to sell it, uh, where to use it and the benefits that it gives you. Pretty much you go from you know, walking into a bank to being your own bank. And when you experience that, uh, I think it's very exciting for people. And so far that's what I have come across. So I have had a lot of people come and say, oh, well, Bitcoin, you know, the negative sentences. And then after they've had a conversation, they go, oh, okay, thank you. I had no idea that it had all these applications. And unfortunately the news and media haven't done a great job in educating people. So that's not just for Bitcoin, you know, there's a lot of things we can apply that to. Moving forward and uh, to a different topic. On today's discussions, I wanna give you a bit of background on who I am. Uh, so my name is Amin Rafi. This is my website, arafi.com. If you want to learn more about me, you can reach out and uh, we can have a discussion. I got involved with Bitcoin in 2013. Since then, I have advised professors, PhD students, postgraduates, undergraduates and high school students in a variety of different countries. That includes the Netherlands, Austria, Germany and Switzerland. My personal background is a polymath background. Uh, industrial design and engineering is a polymath subject. It is very similar to Renaissance kind of a topic. It includes engineering, material studies, ergonomics, environmental studies, social issues, science, psychology, marketing, business, physics, programming, design, 3D modeling, sustainability, etc., etc. The reason for this is that when you design a product, let's say a mobile phone, you need to understand the impact it has on the environment, the materials involved, how the business aspect of it works, the ergonomics of it, the psychological parts, whether it's uh, marketing or the user interacting with the device, the science due to the components within it, uh, the programming due to the interaction of the interface, uh, 3D modeling for rendering and uh, prototyping. So, as a whole, uh, it gives me a very broad perspective uh, when I'm considering whether it's a subject, a product, technology, whatever it may be. So I have taken that and applied it to Bitcoin and uh, done my best to participate in various uh, discussions. So I'm not limited by uh, having a fragmented mind, let's say. I like to believe that I consider many different parts, uh, not just, I guess, from an accounting perspective or a science perspective. I have also been an advisor or spoken at uh, various uh, government or global organizations. Uh, that includes the European Commission, the United Nations, and members of the uh, Dutch or Netherlands uh, United Nations members, and Ministry of Economics of the Netherlands. These were places where I was invited or partook in conversations and it allowed me to get a very wide uh, perspective on what is going on from both inside 
the crypto organizations and those who are trying to learn. I also won the Grand Prix at the next, next uh, UNESCO event in 2017. And that was the Grand Prix. So that was uh, the, the highest award there was. And that was in a place where I was, I don't want to say competing, though it was being, you know, the ideas that uh, I was working on at the time with the project I was working on uh, were being compared to, you know, very large organizations such as Microsoft. I've also lived on cryptocurrencies across four continents over the past seven or eight years. And that includes Australasia, Asia, Europe, North America. Majority of that was in Europe, uh, though those other places have given me an insight on how cryptocurrencies, the projects you know, involving cryptocurrencies have formed or are forming uh, in various countries. And obviously they differ greatly where you are. Though I would have to say the Netherlands and Germany uh, for me are the most exciting places due to the way that it is being applied. Um, though, as we will cover in the rest of this, those things are changing as well. I love this quote because it really puts things in a nice perspective to observe. So if the wrong man uses the right means, the right means work in the wrong way. Over time, I'm sure you have heard of Bitcoin scams and other cryptocurrency scams and how they have been attached to a malfunction of what Bitcoin is, though this could not be further from the truth. This quote puts life in a very nice perspective. So if someone, for example, takes Bitcoin and doesn't understand it and they build a project around it, which has happened many, many times, and I have written articles on this that are on Medium. If you want to read about them, you can reach out. Uh, where a person hasn't understood the space, how the technology works, they have decided to do a crowdfund. They haven't secured the cryptocurrency properly. Their misguided path or incompetence led to the tokens being wrongfully sent, for example. So then the courts were involved and they were credited with the right to go and chase those uh, coins that they wrongfully sent. This shows me that this project did not understand the technology well enough because you have things in place that prevent you from wrongfully sending something. You, know, you can have parameters in place such as a multi-signature wallet, which means that I personally cannot send funds without uh, other members verifying it. And this is exactly what we have done with Bitopia. That's why we have a decentralized autonomous organization or a DAO uh, behind the decentralized autonomous university. And the reason we do it that way is that I can't go on my laptop and send funds to someone without other people seeing what's going on and having a 24 hour time frame, but you can change all these parameters, the time frame uh, in place. So just because some people have used the technology in the wrong way or misunderstood it or have been misguided or they're just, you know, lack of competence in uh, establishing or utilizing the application the correct way does not make the application or blockchain itself uh, be responsible for it. So personal responsibility is a huge part of decentralization. Personal responsibility is a huge part of uh, cryptocurrencies because if you are your own bank, you need to think about security. You need to think about parameters in place. You need to think about things a bit differently. Though with all of that comes you know, this huge uh, new world where you gain benefits by doing so. So you know, it's like, um, like you know, Spider-Man. Uh, with great power comes great responsibility. And uh, I know it's a bit scary for some people, though that's why we're here, uh, to help people through it and make it easy for them to understand. And once people get it, it's, it's really not that complicated. Um, you know, if you can register an email address 
and send an email, you can learn how to send a transaction on a cryptocurrency network, whether it's Bitcoin or anything else. Apart from that, I'm really into uh, biohacking as well. I have, through Wim Hof's method, uh, learned to submerge myself in a frozen lake for seven minutes. I have spoken about this in various talks uh, around uh, Europe. I have done seven days of fasting, which is no consumption of uh, solids for seven days, uh, and the health benefits that goes with it. And uh, I have also trained as a vegan uh, to lift twice my body weight in deadlifting. Uh, so I believe that I, I believe I was about 62 and a half kilos and I did about, uh, I think about 130. Um, so that was very exciting. And now I'm training to do the Iron Cross and there's other things that I do on a personal level, challenge myself and, uh, you know, it, it creates like a, part throughout other parts of my life. So that's a bit about my personal interests. And uh, now we can move on to a different topic. So now you know who I am, uh, the credibility behind the things that I say. Uh, I have done my best to participate in you know, various conversations, apart from those government organizations that have uh, taken part in events ran by, you know, whether it's the globally renowned event called Anarcha Polko, it's, it, it's, which, is, uh, which was started by Jeff Berwick. Uh, I have spoken twice there, this year and last year, and that's an event in Acapulco, alongside, alongside uh, people such as Ron Paul. And uh, of course, goes without saying, uh, the gold standard in the crypto world, Paralini Police, uh, I have spoken there five years uh, in a row, and that for me would be literally the highest level that a person can reach because uh, Paralini Police and the events they run on a yearly basis uh, are incredible. The amount of knowledge I've gained there and the lovely people you meet there are really, truly inspiring. So it's not just important to do academic research, you need to participate in the uh, real world and see what's going on. Because what you read on a piece of paper can be very different to how the real world functions. We have all been to high school and university, and I'm sure we can all relate to the thought that the real world is very different to how it was depicted in the books. So when you have a balance between the two, it's really great. So I've gone the research path and I have gone the uh, application path to see what's really going on. And in the end, Bitcoin for me is not for criminals. Bitcoin and not blockchain is one of the most incredible inventions in human history. And the reason that's been said is because a lot of focus has been put on blockchain and its many applications. And uh, you know, a lot of people say it's not Bitcoin, it's, it's blockchain that's useful. When you have a cryptocurrency, the first time in human history that is decentralized, you cannot avoid saying anything but wow. When you have a cryptocurrency that allows you to be your own bank, that removes the powers of the state or even an entire continent such as the European Central Bank, and allows the individual to have some freedom, again, I would be surprised to hear anything but wow. Though, as you can see, a lot of work for whatever reason has been done to allow such results to come up. So we're gonna fix that. We're gonna, we're gonna you know, it's about re-educating people about what it is and uh, letting them be a part of it. And when they see it and they use it, um, it's so easy, it's so beautiful. And I'm, I, for one, I'm a huge fan. The things that Bitcoin allows you to do from an engineering perspective, so it has a positive impact on accessibility, which means that you don't need to, let's say uh, you are a refugee, you have not been uh, identified by the state identification system. You cannot go and start a bank account. With Bitcoin, you can receive funds. As I said, even a dog or a self-driving car 
uh, can receive funds or make uh, be a part of the network. That's accessibility. Efficiency. You don't have these huge buildings and corporate headquarters and banking facilities and everything else that goes with it. It's very efficient. You can put everything you have on a USB stick. You don't need physical locations. Security. You don't have the security of Bitcoin with your traditional financial systems. Transparency. You know, we'll go into this in our course. Accountability, sovereignty, inclusivity. Very, very powerful stuff. Moving forward. I was intrigued by this sign that I saw uh, when I looked out the window from a family friend's house. Knowledge is power. We can all agree that at some stage in our life, we lack knowledge uh, when it came to a particular topic. And once you have acquired that knowledge, it empowers you to do things differently. Uh, this could be, for example, you have no idea how to drive a car. Once you learned how to drive a car, the safety parameters, and uh, how to do it in a way that is safe both for yourself and other people on the road, and you acquired the car and you started driving, you were empowered. You could now drive to many different locations, which meant that you can access jobs, uh, you can see different places, and it gives you a bit of security. That's empowerment via knowledge and the transfer of knowledge from uh, the driver to the person that's trying to learn. Bitopia, in our first session, uh, was very well received. You can watch the video, it's called Introduction to Decentralization. It took place in the city of San Cristobal in the country of Mexico. I gave every person a booklet to fill out as to why they have not used Bitcoin, what we could do differently for them to feel more part of it and accept it, and other things. I ran this through a, an analysis and uh, I analyzed the data, an analysis of the data took place uh, to formulate and to observe the words that were used by the participants. And you can see this. This is what came out. Knowledge. Knowledge is always... I mean, we can all agree that knowledge is the bridge which allows a person to understand the topic. So even in a democratic society, you might as well be a dictatorship if people are not well informed. What's the point of voting on things when people are not well informed of the topic on which they are voting? Knowledge needs to be there. And once knowledge is there, then we can have a discussion on how various uh, impacts a topic could have. This is the proof as to why Bitopia is very important and where we can close that gap. And uh, hopefully, as more and more people participate and understand a framework behind Bitopia and offer more uh, time and contribute, whether you know financially or uh, via knowledge we can have a great impact on society. And such things can be uh, donate and pay with your knowledge. Imagine that. And turning knowledge into a currency. So these are all the parameters behind Bitopia, taking something so valuable and uh, turning it into a currency that you can either donate or pay with your knowledge, uh, or you can uh, except to learn from others and transfer that knowledge from others to yourself or be in the position to receive that. And you'll be rewarded for your contributions, for your collaboration. And uh, I'm excited to see more and more people partake. Okay, putting that to the side, let's go into uh, this week's news topic, 
which is by Bitcasa. Bitcasa is an organization within the Netherlands that I have included in many of my talks uh, throughout the years. They are very inspiring. Uh, unfortunately, this came out recently. Bitcasa is closing down as of May 17th, 2020. So in three days time. Right now it is the 14th of May, uh, where I am in Australia. And uh, unfortunately, that's the news that's come out. What is Bitcasa? Who operates Bitcasa and why are they closing? Bitcasa was on the front line of getting cafes, bars, restaurants, uh, stores to accept Bitcoin as a form of payment. Because Bitcoin is decentralized, it means that you can go up to your local stores, whether it's your friends or uh, you know, your, your uh, city or suburb, and get people to accept it. There is no Bitcoin team going around getting people to accept it. It's just the average person that uh, enjoys Bitcoin or whatever other currency. It doesn't have to be Bitcoin. Uh, you know, cryptocurrency is subjective. You decide which one you like for yourself, as Andreas Antonopoulos says. And they did a great job. Three people within this city, because they live there and they just decided to do this, uh, got together and did this. I guess on the team it was uh, four people. I personally have met Patrick and Annette, lovely people. And, you know, my hat goes off to them for the effort they put in to get all these locations in, uh, in Arnhem, a city within the Netherlands, to accept Bitcoin as a form of payment. You know, and that's the power of peer-to-peer. -peer. That's the power of decentralization. And uh, it's incredible. And it's very unfortunate that they're closing down. And then that's their meetups. You can join them if you're in the city of... Uh, on him, or perhaps they will do it online for the time being due to the current circumstances. And uh, you can see all the different locations, you know, whether it's a store or a bar or a restaurant or even services, for example. Um, so why are they closing? They're closing because unfortunately, the Netherlands uh, regulation changed, uh, which meant that yesterday it became clear that the mandatory fee for Bitcoin companies in 2020 will be approximately 25,000 euros. You know, this is per year, regardless of the size of the company. Now, that's incredible amounts. Why should it be different to any other organization? Is it perhaps that they think every cryptocurrency organization uh, is loaded with money? I'm not sure. This is a lot of money that they would have to pay to sustain their business. And in a lot of cases, they do this because they just like the technology. I don't, from my understanding, Bitcaster themselves don't make money on top of the transactions that they get these stores to accept. So imagine that, they were just like putting a lot of effort into it and going around and getting stores to accept it because they're very excited about the technology. I myself have done this in the city of Oaxaca in Mexico. And then, you know, being told to pay such ridiculous amounts, 25,000 euros, 25,000 uh, dollars, sorry, 25,000 euros, uh, it's just bizarre. You know, it's just bizarre and it's just not the way to support innovation. And unfortunately, of course, that's, you know, a lot of money uh, they've had to shut down. So in three days time, an organization that has existed for, I believe, yeah, 2014, six years or seven years has had to shut down due to some, whatever you want to call it, due to an legal regulation that was, uh, that was probably introduced by people who have no understanding of the consequence of, of the decision that they have made and the impact it would have on those organizations. Uh, and, you know, they're losing out too because all these organizations will just pack up and go somewhere else. Because it's a decentralized global technology, it means that, you know, you can't strong arm people. They will just leave and go establish their business somewhere where they're treated a bit better. Uh, you know, you can't, you can't do that. 
uh, as we have seen within the United States, as we have seen within various countries. So that part of it is actually quite exciting that we will see which countries are the most friendly uh, because it's a decentralized technology. Uh, we will see these things. And then from there, we might have a global movement towards you know, other countries doing similar things. Um, and that's why decentralized autonomous organizations are very important because they are jurisdictionless and they do not need to adhere to um, such regulations. Uh, though perhaps that will be explored later. I will leave it there for today. Uh, I just want to say thank you to the people behind Bitcasa and the amount of work that they put in raising awareness. And uh, it's unfortunate that they're closing down, though. I'm sure they will persevere and figure out another way to exist, uh, whether as a DAO or another form of an organization. And uh, hopefully we will see a better opportunity in the future. Um, I have a lot of respect for the work that they have done and uh, we'll see where it goes. This evening on the side of the news, uh, I will be speaking with Paralini Police at uh, 1800, Central Eastern Time and uh, I'm very excited for this so if you're around you can jump on this and uh, if you're not I will share this on our channel once it's been uh, recorded and posted on. Uh, they are amazing people they do these uh, conversations uh, on a weekly basis I believe even more so due to current circumstances and you know they are very very uh, knowledgeable and uh, inspiring people that attend the conversations. And I will leave it there. Thank you for joining us for this week. I uh, hope you have a great weekend. If you get a chance, join us on the conversations and uh, catch you soon. Take care.